Hi, I'm here with uh, Jeff Jarvis, who is, uh, I almost feel like I know you. I listen to uh, This Week in Google is every week. Is it Neil Laporte Wonderful and Ginger Cabanne? Yes, they are absolutely fantastic. I've read your books. Thank you very much. Um, I read your blog. You're sick of me by now. Yeah, I follow <laughs> you on Twitter. And do you think there's a difference between uh, the old kind of, you know, getting to know celebrities, uh, soap opera stars, uh, column, newspaper columnists, and this new way where we sort of follow each other but still don't know each other. I mean, this is the first time we, we've met. But this is an opportunity that couldn't yeah. happen before, right? The Internet yeah. enables you to meet more people. I've made friends in China and Iran and Iraq and, all, and in Germany and Sweden and all over the world, which is great, but I couldn't have done it before without traveling. Yeah. So, so, so now I can, and, and I think that's important. It also means that, on the one hand, I think we see a change in mass culture where there's still going to be celebrities. There's always going to be yeah, celebrities, yeah. you know, real stars. Um, but it's probably going to be a little hard. You can argue it two ways. You can argue it's going to be harder to be one yeah. because the risk is higher. You can argue it's a lot easier to be one. We have this woman in the U.S. named Kim Kardashian who's become yeah. a star for no good reason. Um, uh, but it also means that we don't have to look at the whole world in those mass media terms, yeah. right? You can have a hundred followers on Twitter and that's the fame you want to have and you want to have and you don't necessarily aspire to have more than yeah. that, and that's great. I will say, the last couple of years we have seen a backlash towards the internet with a lot of legislation. We have seen uh, negative media reports, like you know the Facebook scare. Uh, but still, I mean, the, fa the internet is almost 20 years old. Why do you think you see that kind of backlash right now, where we legislators want to regulate, uh, media want to report the sort of dark side of the internet? Why now? Well, the internet is actually older than that, but the web started yeah. in October 1994. Yeah. So it's actually very young. Yeah. And I think that's part of the issue, that, that it's, it's causing great change, it's causing great disruption. And what I think we see happening is institutions are recognizing the risk to them, and that's why they're reacting back. The internet's not broken. Why are governments stepping in trying to fix it? Mm. Uh, it's operating just fine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Eric Schmidt said in a speech in Europe two weeks ago that uh, 10 years ago, Four nations censored the internet, now 40 do. Yep. We see efforts to regulate the net under the guises of piracy, privacy, security, decency, and even civility. Um, well, why? Uh, well, part of the reason, I think, is because legacy institutions are very threatened right now. Yeah. The, the internet has, has had more impact and it has more power, and it's a tool that people are using to do what they want to do. But these governments are making a mistake to try to regulate the technology. Yeah. There are behaviors you do want to regulate. Child pornography is illegal for damn good reason, yeah. and you should regulate it across whatever use, uh, whatever technology you use to, to spread it. Um, but if you try to regulate uh, the whole internet to get to that one thing, in Australia and Canada there's talk uh, from some legislators about filtering all the content on the internet mm -hmm. just to get to that. Well then you filter all the speech and all the good things that happen as well. And we have to be aware of those unintended consequences. Yeah. In, in uh, Europe, we've seen both the, the privacy debate, but we've also seen, especially Sweden, there have been a huge debate where we have basically the, the Swedish version of NSA scanning yes. and monitoring all email traffic, for instance, that passes the borders, which is a lot even if you use a Swedish uh, email host. Um, so we, we see a lot of these kind of surveillance mm -hmm. techniques. What's your take on that? Government fancies itself as our best protector of mm -hmm. privacy. It is potentially the worst enemy of privacy yeah. because government has powers no other institution has. The power of, of the law, jail, taxation, mm -hmm. and the army for that matter. Um, and, and, and so I think we have to watch out for government in this case and not let them presume that they uh, are always friendly to us. Yeah. And, and, and so, listen, I was at the World Trade Center on September 11th, mm. 2001. Uh, I believe we need a level of security. Uh, I think that we are negotiating our norms around that and figuring that out. So I, I don't suggest that we have, should have no security, but I do think that blanket efforts to surveil everything uh, do get us in trouble. We yeah. do have rights. So, so the, the discussion ought to happen at a level of principles yeah. and rights. In the United States, you have a right for your physical letter not to be opened. Same as there's a warrant, yeah. right? Well, the same should be true of your other yeah. communication. Yeah. To me, that's very simple. The principle should carry over. And, and don't you also see both uh, in the U.S. And, and in Sweden where 
we have legislation that say, no, you shouldn't be able to use it for A, for instance. And then a few years passes by and suddenly it's okay and the, the legislation just stretches more and more right. into rather creepy territory. Yeah, and that's why we really should keep this discussion at a level of principles. Mm. And, and the technology is going to change underneath that. Mm. At the end of the day, do you have a right to your privacy from government mm. surveillance? Then if you do, you should have that across all media. Mm. What would you say is the biggest fight right now? I think privacy is, mm. is out there. And, and, you know, piracy, SOPA and people yeah. the laws in the United States, was relatively easy to fight back. Uh, because it was it was around entertainment and other yeah. things. Uh, mm -hmm. Privacy matters. Uh, I have a private life. Privacy needs protection. Uh, it's not so easy to mock an effort to protect privacy. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are a lot of things that have unintended consequences. The, the EU principles of the idea that you have a right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Well, when you and I interact, you know, what if I tell you this video? Yeah. I demand that you erase it yeah. because I'm in it and yeah. I don't want that. Well, then I'm, a, I'm impinging upon your yeah. right to speak. And also perhaps people who embed it in their blogs. All of that, yeah. right? So the right to be forgotten sounds simple and sounds nice, but it's not. The other principle that I really fear from the EU's proposals is uh, uh, privacy by default. Yeah. Well, if that were the law of the land, we wouldn't have Twitter or Flickr mm -hmm. and all the wonderful things that come out of that. Why should we presume that everything should be locked up? Uh, People are sharing on the internet for a reason, and I think we've got to start talking not just about the privacy, but also about the benefits of sharing. Yeah. Do you think we need more education about the benefits of sharing, rather than just the scare propaganda from... from well, it's the reason I wrote a book yeah. called Public Parts, out for sale now, right? Um, but it's the reason that I, uh, I felt the need to do that was to discuss that uh, in public mm -hmm. and, 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 and to talk about the benefits. The important thing for both privacy and publicness is you need a choice. Mm. Uh, I think institutions, government should be open by default. Companies would be wise to be open by default. That's not true of you. You should have a choice of which to be. But when you make that choice, when you have a piece of information in your head, one of the questions that I hope you ask is, would it be beneficial to someone else if I shared this? Yeah. It could be trivial. It could be you recommending a movie. Um, it could be important uh, when I talk about my prostate cancer online. Mm. Um, uh, important to someone's life, I mean. And, and, and so there's a choice you have at that moment, and that's what I think we need to talk yeah. about, and that's where the education is needed, I think. In your book, In Public Parts, you're a bit negative about the, the chances of openness in politics. And we've seen through SOPA, for instance, the massive lobbying efforts mm -hmm. from, from the, the copyright industry, and especially the movie industry. Um, so, so what are your takes on that? Do you think that we can, can go ahead with a stronger openness in politics? I think that in the long run, we, the people will demand this of government yeah. and we will expect it of government. Uh, but part of what I talk about in the book is, is the, if all we do is use openness as a weapon against government, mm. government will fight openness. Yeah. We also have to use openness for collaboration, mm. for positive things, mm. good things. Mm. And um, that when we do that, I think government will start to see that there are mm -hmm. benefits to this. Yeah. But also, it, it's the business of the people. It is our stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what we saw in, in WikiLeaks was that there's a banality to the secrecy the government keeps. Um, a lot of things that got out were fine, were no big deal. Uh, or, or were a big deal in the sense that some of that information helped lead to the revolution in Tunisia. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we have to respect uh, transparency. But what we've seen instead, the first reaction to change, the first reaction to this threat is to put more walls around. Mm. And that's but also when you see the, look, look at the political parties and the political process there, uh, there's not a lot of dialogue with, uh, with, with uh, the people, mm -hmm. actually. There's mm -hmm. quite a quite closed system. That's the way politics is built. Yeah. Politics is built by having a stand and a platform and a message, and it's top-down. Mm. Uh, and Do you so, think that will change? Not in the short run, no. because uh, you know, in the, in the United States, very differently from, from Europe, we have campaigns that never end, yeah. and big money influences it because of television, mm. and that's unfortunately going to remain the case for mm. a while. I don't think that we'll find the revolution come uh, through presidential elections mm. or through top-level elections. I think that the US, U.S. might start to mimic more of Europe in a parliamentary system where you, you start to make inroads by electing representatives. Yeah. And you, you mentioned uh, television. Do you think we, we see that, that uh, viewers are leaving television? 
um, few few people subscribe to paper magazines. Mm -hmm. Where will the, you're, I mean, you're a professor of journalism. Where will we see the media industry or the news industry in five or ten years? Well, this what is why I teach them? entrepreneurial journalism. Yeah. I'm teaching my students to make their own jobs. Yeah. And even if they don't do that, I'm trying to teach them to be more aware about the business because mm -hmm. we in journalism in the United States were taught that business was corrupted. We should mm -hmm. stay away. Uh, well, it made us irresponsible stewards and protectors of journalism. So at one level, all I want to do is try to get journalists to be aware of the pressures and, and factors mm -hmm. uh, that are going to have an impact on their careers and on what they can do for society. And ideally, what they're going to do is make successful companies and yeah. on there. I don't know exactly where it's going to go in five years. Um, I, we're concentrating so much these days in the discussion about trying to preserve old methods and old business models and mm -hmm. old structures, where we have all kinds of new ways to do journalism. Yeah. Um, you know, just just what we see happening in, in very infant ways with data and how data can be journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas Tribune is a site in the U.S. Yeah. where people can go in and they can query data and find out about it and talk about it. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily take the form of an article. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. I think we have to explore, experiment a lot more. You think we will see a shrinking uh, news industry where the big players get bigger and the smaller, perhaps local, um, in, in a way, I might, I might argue the opposite, yeah. where um, in one sense you're right that there's consolidation and the mm -hmm. companies buy each other up, they're kind of dinosaurs huddling against the cold of the, uh, of the internet wind coming. But in the other sense, you see an explosion with blogs mm -hmm. of a whole, many more smaller players. Yeah. So at, at City University of New York, where I teach uh, in the Townite Entrepreneurial Center, we uh, did some research on what it would look like in a city like Boston in the U.S., mm -hmm. a city of five million people, if the paper died. Because at the time, it, it looks like it might. And I don't yeah. want to kill the paper. I love the newspaper. But if it did, what we see is an emerging ecosystem of many smaller players. Yeah. Now, they also struggle to find the business model, and we'll see how much that works. But I think, inevitably, you'll find yes, some temporary consolidation, which you'll find, mm -hmm. I think, in the long run, more smaller players having a role in this ecosystem. Yeah. Very interesting. And... My final question, what's next? What do you think I have is the, the faintest idea. I, I, I think what I, I, I'm enjoying watching these days yeah. is how we thought that Google had taken over the world and mm -hmm. Google was everything, after we thought Microsoft had taken over the world yeah. and Microsoft was everything. And then now, you know, we, we ask about Facebook and Twitter. What we see, I think, is, is human links, mm -hmm. peers links, starting to really challenge the hegemony of search. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing. I think mm. It's wonderful uh, that we see uh, these multiple forces happening. So, so that'll be the next thing for a while because we've already seen it happen. It wasn't hard to predict that because I'm just saying what's happening now. What comes after that? I have no idea. So, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Talk. You're welcome to Sweden. Thank you.